Welcome to Early Access PyCharm. I'm your host, Nafiul Islam. Today, we're going to be talking to Andre from the WebStorm team, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how PyCharm's web capabilities are built and what has changed over the course of his tenure as a member of the WebStorm team to what they've got planned for the future. So, Andre, the only thing that I know about you is that you lead the WebStorm team. What does WebStorm have to do with PyCharm? There are two questions here. First of all, I want to mention, actually, I am team lead uh, of uh, the Web WebStorm team the last uh, year, a bit more oh. than one more year. Before me, it, it was uh, another uh, team lead. So for me, it's some kind of new experience, uh, and it was uh, really interesting and challenging because uh, it was at the time of uh, the lockdown. <laughs> of course, we have remote uh, distributed team because uh, some colleagues work uh, in München, some in Poland, and also we have developers in Amsterdam and St. Petersburg. Makes sense. So this is a new experience for you. WebStorm is actually our web offering. This is what we use to build our front end technologies. Um, tell me a little bit more about how WebStorm came to be and essentially where it is right now. It's an interesting question because back then WebStorm was a part of PHP Storm, as far as I know. And at the, some point, uh, there was a de de decision to split the team into two, like uh, PHP Storm team and WebStorm team that will handle everything related to the JavaScript development. And I believe it was a good decision because uh, now uh, JavaScript is not only the front-end language or language for front-end development, but it also a back-end language. Yes, we have Node.js and uh, also Dino. Do we support Dino yet in WebStorm? Yes, we have a plugin for Dino. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah. After the decision, uh, we started to work uh, more precisely on the web JavaScript technologies development. Some people said that uh, it was really challenging back then because when I joined the web WebStorm team, uh, front end started to grow so very fast like we had new framework every week <laughs> and it was all about decisions like do we really need to support this framework uh, in our id or it will die in a couple months if you talk about webstorm at uh, this moment uh, right now oh, it's a different thing because uh, now we have uh, three major frameworks angular view and react of course uh, some people can say that there is also svelte but it's not so popular yet and everything that we considered to develop to improve uh, it's related to these technologies and of course uh, about javascript language uh, itself so tell me about the contrast between what's happening now because right now you have to support vue react and angular and there are multiple versions of angular they come up with a new one all the time so tell me a little bit about you know how it was like in the good old days of jQuery when jQuery was web development <laughs> and now it's not. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it was in the jQuery times. Uh, I know how it was when I joined the team. It was... When did you join the WebStorm team? Seven years ago. Seven so years was... ago. My goodness. You're an OG. Yeah. yeah. The problem there was uh, there are too many frameworks. 2014 ES6 standard uh, wasn't yet released. So we had some proposals. We had some features that can be a part of the standard, but we weren't sure about it. And there are a lot of languages similar to JavaScript, for example, CoffeeScript. Do you know CoffeeScript? I personally used to use something called Iced Coffee Script. It had something, it had two keywords, uh, async and defer. So it made handling callbacks a lot easier, but this is like ancient history. 
Yes, yes. And it's interesting fact that CoffeeScript had several dialects, including Ice uh, yeah. script. And it was uh, the same for all the part for the front end development. So back then, you know, everything was emerging, everything from languages, dialects of languages, frameworks. I mean, do you remember CanJS and Ember.js and Backbone.js and all these different frameworks? Why do you think people kind of settled on React? Uh, it's interesting question. Uh, one of the reasons I believe that it was supported by huge companies like Facebook. And also it introduced a good conception that uh, was really easy to understand and to implement. And the same thing we can say about uh, Angular, like it, it introduced to very simple conceptions and it also supported, supported by a huge company. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why around the, uh, the framework, uh, the technology can be built a good community, but uh, it doesn't work all the time, but I believe it worked for Angular and React. I see. So what I found interesting about the whole React and Angular thing is that it was a move towards single page applications. But that meant like typical frameworks such as Django in the Python world, or Flask in the Python world, you know, they were mostly making APIs. So you saw a rise of backends just making APIs that were simple layers over the databases, right? They provided authentication, they provided rate limiting, e tags, all that good stuff. And the front end, it still had the Node.js server because you still need to serve these files, right? but you were working with single page applications. So why is it that things are slowly coming around back to server side rendering after all this time? Uh, actually, I, I don't know <laughs> the answer. Uh, we can guess uh, that uh, just very simple for uh, front end developers uh, to, uh, understand how it works and you can focus on the technologies uh, uh, you don't need to think about uh, the backend at all it's just an api for you uh, and you can build everything that you need on the front end side makes sense but you know now that server side rendering is slowly coming back. I think there's hot wire. I think React also made some leeways into having server side rendering. Does it feel like it's it's just what's in fashion or is it that there are benefits and people are like, you know what, maybe single page applications involve just too much work. Right now it works the way that uh, you use server side rendering and still use all single page application conceptions. So it's just a way to speed up or the rendering at the first time. And after that, you can work with the rich application. You're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Yeah, def definitely. If we talk about server-side rendering for uh, front-end uh, development, it's usually done also on the Node.js side. And you don't need to invest time in uh, the study other technologies so you can do everything using javascript and react for example and it just will work makes sense but you know one of my pet peeves about front end in general is that it's very complicated and i know that's a subjective way of looking at it but you know you have pre-compiled languages like typescript that have their own map files. And then you have this thing called Webpack, which is a monster in and of itself. How do you keep up with all these tools that are popping up every five seconds? Because it, uh, front end and... isn't, isn't simple anymore. Back in the good old days, well, I think it's the good old days. You just put a script tag in your HTML, <laughs> write some jQuery, and that's it. Now you have a pre-compiler. You have post CSS, you have this, you have that. How on earth do you get the time to actually make tooling for all this? 
actually, if we talk about onboarding, like you want to build an application, you can just use Create React app and it just works. So you don't need to think about uh, the details like how Webpack works or React translated into the JavaScript code and so on. And actually, I believe the same problem there is uh, with all big languages, like let, let's call it big. If you talk about Java, there is Spring Boot that uh, just a framework that solves almost every possible problem about the web, uh, web development. And you cannot just understand how it works. It's a magic if you started to work, to work, if you started to use it, it's a magic for you. And the same too for all frameworks. If we talk about Java, we can also mention so Hibernate or something like that. So basically you're defending the complication of everything. It's like, hey, we do everything. So it's but, okay if it does everything. But, but we understand why we do it, why we need a webpack, why we need TypeScript, because it solves some problems. And yeah, the setup in general is a part of magic <laughs> uh, because you don't understand how Webpack works. But uh, you know that Webpack builds for you optimized code uh, that includes everything that you need and so on. And yeah, it helps. Yeah, in Webpack, we trust. <laughs> so um, you've been building new features in WebStorm like crazy. I've been looking at your release notes. A lot of these things are coming over to PyCharm as well. Tell me about, you know, what are you going to be focused on next? What is your next big thing for WebStorm? As I mentioned before, we don't have a lot of frameworks that we need to support because JavaScript uh, development are not split it like it was before. Right now we have uh, three major frameworks like Angular, React, Vue, and we want to improve uh, overall experience for the, the users of the frameworks. Like introduce new inspections, introduce uh, new fixes, introduce integrations for the frameworks. It's one of our focuses. Of course, we need to support new versions of uh, languages, including TypeScript and JavaScript, something that has to be done by default. And also we think a lot about onboarding. We have a lot of features, a lot of refactorings, fixes, and so on. And or it's pity that a lot of our users just don't know about the features. It's just very sad for us. We have the same problem in PyCharm. We do a lot, but you know, not all the features are discoverable. So on yeah, that note, and... thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon. See you soon. Bye.